This um, last hour of the meeting, I, I wrote um, that we uh, wrote up that we could start discussing um, national collaborative projects, and those projects were divided into two. One was a, a writing grant to get a brainstorming session, which I think we'll start with, and then the second one was uh, a guidelines uh, discussion. So, with the grants, writing a grant together. Um, so. Um, I, I think it, this is sort of a, I think a more like a brainstorming session, sort of holding hands and seeing kumbaya session. So everyone gets to know each other, and um, just to sort of start the discussion, um, what I've done is I've put up here um, a couple of projects under the Australasian Ocular Melanoma Alliance, um, which are the subgroup of the Mar uh, Melanoma Skin Cancer Trials Limited um, group uh, of trials of projects in development. There certainly have been a couple of projects that have failed already. So we started with. Um, the MRFF rare cancers call, and so um, that was the first um, grant we put in under the AOMA banner. Uh, that didn't get up, and um, it was a good learning experience, however, to design uh, a number of uh, trials for ocular melanoma uh, for a rare cancer, and that was an interesting exercise. Uh, that didn't get up, and then um, Shanine uh, put one in for the second rare cancers call with a, with a sting agonist um, that didn't get up and so um, the uh, so some of these have been recycled and so just so you so you, you know then currently uh, the guy, uh, Mark and the staff Libby uh, Alex and Narelle um, have been fantastic in helping with some of the infrastructure for these grants so the uveal melanoma registry grant I, I've mentioned already so that's happening money will flow um, the other two grants um, here uh, Michael and Ellen are, are leading this Spectrum grant, which is being submitted to NHMRC next week, uh, as is uh, Shanine's uh, recycled um, Sting Agonist grant for ocular melanoma, the grant also being recycled to NHMRC. Um, so those are the current projects in development, and um, the, but there are lots of other funding opportunities. So I think um, the philosophy here is that we should think big, um, it's a rare cancer. If we don't work together as a national group, we're not going to any. We're not going to get any serious money um, from any national funding or international funding body. And we should also bear that in mind that some of these some of these international funding bodies, the DoD, for example, fund ex US grants. QRM don't necessarily do, but DoD do. That's the Department of Defense grant granting mechanism. Um, so we certainly would have to uh, work together. And there are some uh, uh, um, excellent. And, and very highly qualified um, and well-funded people on the panel that I thought could start by talking about the principles of their success in um, NHMRC um, grant and translational oncology grants. So um, uh, I mean, I'll, maybe what I'll do is uh, we can start uh, with Mark, can perhaps talk about what you see as the principles of drawing together a rare cancer collaborative group to put in a grant that could potentially work uh, at NHMRC level and then maybe hand over to Georgina and Richard who have also really done fantastic work in bringing together multidisciplinary teams dealing with a broad array of issues surrounding a tumour um, uh, and maybe just start the discussion then and then, and then, perhaps, then perhaps hand off to Bertel for his experience about uh, the international aspects of, you know, as potentially as the external reviewer, what would he be looking for in, a, in the pertinent questions in ocular melanoma that perhaps an Australian group could, could grapple with. Sure, happy to kick off. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so I guess the, I mean, the NHMRC system and the MRFF system, which sort of kind of sits slightly awkwardly next to it at the moment, um, is clearly in a state of flux at the, is, is actually clearly in a state of flux. In fact, the flux is happening right now. There's a whole new bunch of schemes that are currently available and we're all working like mad behind the scenes to meet those deadlines, uh, even in the next few days. Um, but that, so that includes, you know, both the, well, the, both the, both the ideas grant scheme, uh, which is probably going to be more suited to basic and more translational research projects, as well as the clinical trials and cohorts scheme. Uh, and that's the scheme to which those two later studies are going to be submitted um, via the MASK trials group. So uh, I, I think at the moment it's fair to say we're all a bit uncertain as to what uh, what sort of applications are going to be competitive um, in these in these schemes. Historically, the NHMRC 
project grants that supported clinical trials typically were most interested in you know, quite large scale kind of high impact potential trials, so more the sort of true phase three space. Um, and we had some success with the trials group in attracting funding um, for, for, for that type of study um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so it's likely, I guess, that the scheme, but, but, um, but that, was, that was part of the project grant scheme in essence, except it was the, 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 kind of the, the old project grant scheme, but it was, the, it was the clinical trials component of that. So I suppose we don't know if the new clinical trials and cohort specific scheme is you know, basically going to be um, uh, uh, essentially the same type of scheme, so basically a project grant scheme that will be supporting the sorts of clinical trials that used to be supported through that scheme. Um, if it is, then it's mostly going to be interested in the you know, much sort of higher impact, um, you know, practice changing phase three types of projects rather than the more sort of early phase innovative translational element type of projects. And I don't think we quite know yet. I don't feel like there's a strong sense as to what, uh, it'll be you know, very interesting to see those types of grants that end up being supported through, through, through that scheme. My hunch would be that they probably mostly will still support the sort of larger scale phase three type studies rather than the more early phase uh, sort of innovative studies um, because something has to replace the old project grant scheme that mostly supported that type of research. Um, uh, but I think it, it does actually remain to be seen. We're really not quite sure at the moment. Um, so I think from the point of view of uveal melanoma, um, I mean, we're, we, we're not really at the, you know, kind of high level phase three trials. Um, we, we, we're just not in that space at the moment. We're clearly in a phase where we're, like cutaneous melanoma was 10 or 15 years ago, where we're, um, you know, looking for targets and, um, and, and, and exploring the biology and, and un undergoing process, you know, phases of preclinical testing and workup and, and, and you know, lo looking, for, looking for the efficacy signal that we hope will trigger a whole series of trials down the track. So I think at the moment we have to be submitting even those sort of early phase, innovative, iterative, translational type grants into the clinical trial scheme because we actually don't know what, what, what it's mostly going to support. But I'm not, I suppose, super confident at this, at this stage. And it actually might be with the appropriate pitch um, that those types of trials might be very adequate for the ideas grant scheme, in fact, um, whereby you could imagine that you could have as an aim in those grants, um, you know, linked to a whole bunch of other, you know, basic research aims and, and sort of translational themes, um, a, you know, a relatively small scale early phase trial that was, that was, that was looking for a signal based on the biology that had been explored um, um, in other aspects of the grant. So, you know, so it's, I actually think we should probably, so for those types of grants, which are, or projects, which is, you know, mostly what a, what a lot of our uveal clinical projects are at the moment, um, they, in fact, might end up being uh, quite, quite well suited um, to the ideas grant scheme. But again, we don't know because we're just still not quite sure what types of research uh, and, and w whether the ideas scheme will, in fact, support, w will, in fact, support clinical trials at all. I mean, historically, the project grant scheme, um, at least outside of the formal clinical trials panels, really didn't 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 support clinical trials at all. So it's really in a state of flux at the moment. It's it's, it's actually quite challenging. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I didn't hear the question. Back to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for your insights there, Mark. Um, I don't know whether if that helps us or not, but it, it's yeah, it's definitely a tough field getting. Um, getting grants, uh, you know, you ask us from our success in cutaneous melanoma, how can, what ideas have we got that might assist the uveal melanoma community and I don't have any easy answers to it. The first thing is to bring people together. For rare diseases you're not going to have success unless you have people working together and organising meetings like today's meeting is, is critical for that. It demonstrates um, that people are willing to work together. It also um, energizes at people and, and, and you know pushes things forward. So I think that's a critical first step. Um, the issue about consumer patient engagement is absolutely critical in grant success. So having Michael up here and him uh, participating in the meeting and discussions is very important. And also as an active partner and and uh, a, a, with important input into the development of 
grant ideas and, and, um, and formal applications is critical. And you sort of covered those earlier in your talks, Anthony. Um, the new grant scheme, as Mark says, is that we're still trying to get our heads around what's the best strategy. Why we had success in melanoma was predominantly, in cutaneous melanoma, was predominantly because of um, the program grant scheme was really set up to reward collaborative effort, multidisciplinary collaborative effort. And we had a great multidisciplinary team of people based in Sydney, but also including others in other parts of the country. And, and, and that, was, um, you know, that was critical to, to our success. The new scheme, however, is in my view, anti-collaborative. You're only allowed to put your name on, on you know, two grants, basically. And one of them, if you've got to fund your own salary, like most of us do, it's got to be an investigator grant. So you've only got one other slot that you can use. So um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a bit down about it, to be honest, that the clinical trials um, budget is beefed up and it doesn't, um, doesn't have the same restrictions on, on um, numbers of, of grants you can go on. So, you know, that, that's, I'll be pushing things more towards that than the, the ideas grant, maybe fall back to the ideas grants. Um, yeah, I guess there, there's the some thoughts. Yeah, the MRFF. Again, we don't r really understand how that works and it. Maybe I'm a little, you know, maybe this is not the right thing to say, but it seems to me some of the grants that have been successful so far have been sort of targeted. You know, there's been a, the, 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 the call's been put out or someone's had a word to the minister. I don't know if this is true, but it seems like they've been put out with specific groups in mind or ideas in mind. So, you know, we're not at the stage yet, it seems to me that it's really a general call out, you know, and the fact that you guys weren't successful in that initial grant, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't worry too much. I wouldn't take that to suggest that the grant wasn't a very important or, or worthy uh, yeah, grant. For sure, I mean, my, my thoughts, it's also difficult when you don't have any treatments. I mean, the, one of the grants that was successful was a um, treatment, uh, was a trial for leukaemia, I think, that had mu different arms for surveillance with different drugs, and so we don't, quite, don't have quite that luxury. Um, we hardly have a treatment. Uh, so, um, uh, well, so yes, that was... Yes, but you have a good treatment, therapy. you have an active therapy. So, that, so that's, that's obviously challenging. Georgina would be well placed to dis, um, perhaps highlight some of the multidisciplinary, you know, research that we do and wh why that's so. Wh why it's been successful. Um, I, just just thinking about it, um, one way to think about the whole issue of ocular melanoma is think of it as a program and then divvy it up to the big questions we have. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating what others have already said, but if we think about risk, I mean, we do this with all the risk of ocular melanoma, diagnosis of early ocular melanoma um, and risk stratification within that group and then advanced uh, ocular melanoma and then what we do in our own program, supportive care and survivorship and then health economics is what we do for cutaneous melanoma. But if we start to put a structure around that and see where the holes are, because one uh, thing we tend to want to do is drugs, you know, the very sexy drugs, try and make an impact on overall survival. But maybe if we put some effort into the earlier part, we might actually make a better dent into overall survival. So I guess um, the grant structure may f help force us to think about our areas and domains and then rather than slot ourselves around a grant, slot the grants around what we want to achieve. And um, the, a good example would be with these large pots of money, like the um, even infrastructure grants from the ACRF, how can we leverage that by thinking about the whole problem and the holes? So I would rather take a whole research program and then fit grants into us rather than the other way around. I'm sorry to hog it up this end, but so were you guys involved in, because the, there was a melanoma grant that, were, that, that the ACRF gave out to support infrastructure around melanoma research. Can you recall, were you involved in that and were you, can you recall the, the way that was pitched? That's actually a great idea. I'm not sure whether you mean the recent MRL, yeah, the ACEMED, that's what, I, but that's, yeah, is it? Yeah. Do you want to talk to that, the total body? So the grant was to 
fund devices to do 3D whole body imaging for screening of patients. Uh, and then there's been a whole series of grants to actually do research that, that have come up that, again, um, very, very targeted grants yeah. from the, the um, MRFF. And that's attractive because it works at the prevention end. A and that's a very cost effective way to deal with disease. move on to what your perspectives would be. Australia, everyone, let's say everyone gets on, everyone's happy to share tissue. We've got how many cases per year in Australia? Let's say, we don't know, Let, let's, let's estimate 60. Sorry? 200. 200. Yeah, 200. 70, 80 enucleations, 120 plaques. Uh, a bit of fractionated and some fractionated <laughs> radiation <laughs> as well. Uh, what, 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 what do you think, what would you be attractive as an international observer in terms of this, if we came forward and said, you know, what, what we could, this is what we're going to work together and we can collect biospecimens, what okay. can we do? Well, I've written some notes for the past few seconds. One, I want to look at the track record of the workers and what papers they published and where to see if they're going to fulfill their promises. Really important is patient numbers. Can we do have enough patients for statistics? And are we going to get those numbers in a reasonable amount of time, reasonable time? And that means collaboration. And do the, do the participants have enough resources to do what they say they're going to do in terms of infrastructure, data, managers, and all these kinds of things? Is the research question a good one, and are the data going to provide answers to that question, or are the data irrelevant or lacking in some respect? And is any knowledge gained going to be novel, or is it going to repeat something that's been done before? Um, I think one big uncertainty that we have is is it safe to observe these small melanomas until growth is documented? <clears throat> or are we missing an opportunity to prevent metastatic disease? Because we see something and we hope it's not a melanoma, but then it turns out to be a melanoma and then the patient gets metastasis. Might that have been prevented? Should we be doing biopsies earlier to, to, instead of observing possible melanomas for many years? If we treat somebody with a, with a plaque and the tumor recurs, does the patient die as a result of that? Now that we're doing biopsies before plaque radiotherapy, do any melanomas switch from disomy 3 to monosomy 3 because of the failure of the radiotherapy? Those are things that really interest, interest me. I really like the, uh, what you said about an infrastructure grant to enable people to, to, to participate in a, in a research project, as opposed to just, just sponsoring people who are already thriving, and then you're losing lots and lots of cases because the rest don't have a chance. So how are you going to, let's say, a data manager, how are you going to sponsor, fund a data manager if one center sees a few patients and another center sees more? And there's da part-time data managers, or you can pay per case uh, a certain amount of money according to the, the amount of work involved per case. I, I don't know, but, but these are just thoughts that have come to mind. I mean, there, are some there, are, there are some advantages in Australia. We've got national mutual recognition of ethics. So, um, so for example, we could even just have one centre in Australia where the, the consents can be um, or sent out from, and um, we're doing that at a moment with an exceptional responder program. It's only at one centre. Everything is done by telehealth. Um, but we'll start crossing those bridges with the registry project where we're going to start to explore it. Initially, we're not state by state. So we'll go to the Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and start to plan out how to draw information in um, to a central registry that will start help us work out and answer those questions about what you do about the small uh, nevi and tracking them because we'll hopefully be able to track those patients with the passage of time through this registry and contribute to, to a global 
Yeah. Um, can, any, can anybody treat uveal melanomas if they don't fill certain requirements? In Britain, we're obliged to have a registry. Otherwise, we're not supposed to treat melanomas. We don't get funding unless we collect data, that kind of thing. And that has really helped me because the hospital at times had other priorities and wanted to invest the funds in cataracts and money-making conditions like that. And orphan diseases got left to one side. But by having a, an organization that, that obliged the hospital to give us what we needed, the space, the office space for our team and so on, otherwise they would stop our funding, that enabled us to survive. So the cavalry came and rescued our service a few times. Do you, do you so want to talk about a, drawing together the... As an ophthalmic clinician, yeah. I'd just like to talk about that last question of who's allowed to do what um, and how do you ever get to have someone allowed to uh, do a database? And I said, in retinoblastoma, we've got a, a voluntary group that uh, is trying to data share for management of retinoblastoma because even at 25 cases, we're probably below the international level for one centre, let alone um, a distributed centre. And we're trying through the College of Ophthalmology where they have clinical practice guidelines, which says the, the idea of these is to say that uh, really, as the NHS have done, you've, it's got to be data dri driven. And I think that that's one of the things that we as ophthalmic clinicians see is that we get no support in our institution. And like Bertel, if you sit up at night trying to do it yourself, you fail because you're trying to reinvent a wheel, which is already very well done elsewhere. But we need help right at that coalface of uh, trying to diagnose patients early. I think that you know the question of uh, uh, funders imaging, they're, they're rolling out a, a, uh, an imaging system of uh, diabetic retinopathy. And there's going to be a whole lot of imaging taken. And that's going to pick up not everybody. But um, uh, you know we need to be fed you know, nevi that are found in, in imaging things, as have been done in previous studies. But if we don't have any way to record that information, as clinicians, all we do is see it, we tick it, and it, and it goes on. And we, we really need help to be, uh, you know, uh, seen to be as one centre with, this, you know, collecting the similar data. We all need to decide on what's your minimum data set. Um, and we need to have the same forms in Queensland, and New Zealand and every, uh, every territory in between. Once we've done that at the ophthalmic end, um, then we can actually feed patients into the system because one of the problems I see is that this is going to be, the melanoma treatment group is going to be driven at one level by uh, systemic therapies and that's pretty well supported with infrastructure. The ophthalmic end, you know, I work in an eye hospital, um, uh, they just don't really want to know about it. And it's how we translate that, n that need that we have so that we can actually feed all that information in. And, you know, doing it state by state is going to be okay, but it's not going to be sufficient to, uh, to run trials unless we deal with that level. Um, and I think that we need to include New Zealand because they are um, a part of the College of Ophthalmology. We, we want guidelines that are going to cover both countries, and I think that's what the New Zealanders said. Yeah, the guidelines are really important for standardization because, for instance, uh, tumors get measured in different ways in different centers. For instance, tumor thickness, some centers measure from the inner scleral surface, others from the outer scleral surface. Ciliary body, some people regard the tumors involving ciliary body only if the pars plicata is involved, whether with others, the pars plana, forms an anatomical part of the body. And these make very big differences. So these, these uh, guidelines are terrifically important to make sure that we don't just have the same f questionnaires, the same forms, but we also measure things the same way. Visual acuity, for instance, the Snellen chart is useless for any statistics. You need to use logarithmic charts, which are much more scientific and so on. Yeah, I'm glad I'm sitting right up this end because I want to take it back into a, 
a, a primary care sort of sphere. I think a whole lot of work, and I think some of you have alluded to it, needs to be looked at as far as case finding goes. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the incidence of um, nevi are on the fundus. Um, I don't know, and I wonder if our optometrical colleagues and our general ophthalmologist colleagues know of what is the follow-up of a nevus, who needs to see it, who needs to decide as to whether it requires ongoing surveillance, what are the what are the protocols and what are the triggers for getting a either a retinal specialist or an ocular oncologist involved. So I think some of those early, you know, it'd be nice to actually have a set of guidelines that can go out to the optometrists and, and Max mentioned this to me in the in the corridor. They're the ones that are looking at, at heaps of eyes. And that's a great initiative and I think that's something we should be as a group be thinking about. The and I think also Georgina has alluded to this, the front end detecting cases early, screening uh, patients, finding nevi, finding small melanomas. And I think in this day and age, the front line of screening is the optometrist. I mean, optometrists are doing a huge number of photographs. The technology has improved tremendously. I'm seeing a, maybe three or four nevi a week being referred by, I'm being referred by mainly optometrists, but also general ophthalmologists. But I feel they need support in terms of um, <clears throat> being given some guidelines and the importance of patients having a baseline assessment of their nevus, a risk, I mean a, a, a level of risk assessment by somebody who's familiar with that and then being provided with some uh, obviously patient education and some guidance in terms of going forward having the lesion reviewed, etc. I think that's very important and I think it's something we should think about as a group and maybe uh, even invite some optometrists next time we have a meeting. Could, could I ask a quick question? Is there data on what is the f frequency of um, mel uh, uveal melanomas arising from a nevus? In cutaneous, about a third come from a nevus and or half come from a nevus and half in de novo skin. And for individual nevi, is there data on what is the risk of transformation to a melanoma? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing research on at the moment. Because, believe it or not, until recently, I never saw a nevus, so to speak, because I worked in a center of excellence. If there was a nevus, I didn't even notice it, because I was just focusing on the melanoma. But now at Oxford, I'm on the front line. I've, I've gone to outside the ivory tower, and I'm working on the grassroots. And we're being deluged with lots and lots of nevi. So that's why I've developed this moles scoring system to differentiate moles from melanomas according to the size, thickness. And unlike the American system, it doesn't need ultrasonography or anything. It just needs a color photograph. And, um, and that's being evaluated at the moment. I think the problem... Just on that, do you have specific policies and match that? How are you doing? How do you do that? If I'm thinking of an analogous thing in cutaneous melanoma, but yeah. how do you do that? Sorry about my ignorance about a nevus on the retina. But. Well, at the moment, I'm using my fuzzy logic based on the small melanomas I've seen over the past 30 years and conventional wisdom as to what differentiates a nevus from a melanoma, whether there's clumps of orange pigment, serious retinal detachment, diameter more than three disc diameters, uh, documented enlargement, mushroom shape, these five things. You can't, because they're flat. You, uh, you just can't biopsy them. And I've worked with people who have biopsied really small melanomas, less than one millimeter thick, half a millimeter thick, successfully and reliably. And very few ophthalmologists are prepared to do that. What I was going to say was that that uh, the problem is that in a hospital you expect certain standards from a specialist who monitors these lesions. You've got to do uh, color photography, OCT, autofluorescence. You've got to inform the patient. The patient must understand the risks, the, 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 that a possibility of malignancy is there, otherwise you wouldn't be following up the patient. And yet, when we did the survey in the United States with the Ocular Melanoma Foundation, one of the main complaints was 
that they never had, the patients in the community never had any of these tests. They weren't told that the lesion that was being observed might be malignant, so they didn't bother going for follow-up. And then years later, they had a melanoma, and they wished they had been told of that possibility as before. So the optometrists and the general ophthalmologists in the community should not manage these patients unless they tick certain boxes that we have to take in hospital. I think that's really important. With regards to, come to, to switch from malignant transformation of nevi, I'm a bit skeptical about that because small melanomas look just like nevi. And we can't really tell whether it's a, it's a melanoma that takes a, is growing so slowly that you can't see it or whether it really is a transformation. I suspect that in many of these cases, not transformation at all, it's just slow growth. 10% of something small is really nothing. Very difficult to detect. Um, so six per million, six per hundred of us have a, a nevus. That's a sort of general. And every year, I've worked out from Arun Singh's data, the chances of anyone getting a melanoma within a particular year are one in 400,000 if they're 40 years old, one in 100,000 if they're 60 years old, and one in about 80,000 if, if uh, they're over 60. So you get these vast numbers of patients with nevi and these very few patients with melanoma. And that's why hospitals in Britain are panicking about the deluge of patients that they're having to cope with. Uh, uh, just a quick related question, I suppose, to that, that, that upfront aspect of the management. Are there any, are there any, image, uh, are there any Im uh, uh, machine learning uh, studies involved in image analysis of nevi that are out there and being done? Is that an idea for a research study? Yeah, my successor in, uh, at UCSF has got somebody in Berkeley who's got the technology, and I'm in, I've promised to send as many pictures as I can that I've collected over the past 40 years of small nevi and small melanomas in order to try and develop that. But at the moment, you need l so many pictures that we, we, we don't have enough images. But the technology is changing so that fewer and fewer images are required. For this for this process, the challenge is that at the break, just McGarvin suggested. Uh, yeah, you, you want to talk about what you're doing with the it, with the image analysis and the, the potential. Actually, I'm doing up for other melanoma and uh, other is, uh, eye diseases, not the uh, ocular melanoma. So I'm using the image from the OCT data also the two-dimensional any image, and then applying the deep learning model. But uh, uh, for the deep learning model, we need a lot of images, but there are uh, other artificial neural network models so that we can apply for the small images, small number of images, then we can get the result. But deep learning model needs the uh, huge number of images so that we can get the accuracy, like accurate accuracy. So in this case, I talked to the Professor Josh about it, so that if we are going to start, like you are going to start to collect a lot of data in Australia, so if it is possible to collect the OCT and other images, then day by day we can apply different algorithm. Also, we can improve the algorithm for adjusting, for tuning these images, so that we can get, we can apply our method to detect and in early stage or changing at the, during the time, and changing from one stage to another stage using the image processing method. So, okay, so we can maybe start and we can look other approaches which are applied maybe before for ocular melanoma. So comparing those, we can do such thing. I was just gonna comment on what happens in the community. I think in New Zealand, they have a national diabetic photography screening service. Um, I don't think that it's got machine learning on that at this point in time, but I know Google and every other company is trying to get so, into these yeah. sorts of spaces. So Yeah, so when I was doing my PhD in Cambridge, then at that time, uh, another one of my colleague was working in image processing. He was doing PhD. Now, then he developed the DeepMind 
company in UK and Google bought that company and recently they published with the new method like uh, my friend he developed new method with the help of Google and that method they have collected the OCT image like collecting OCT image from the two hospital collaboration with two hospitals in UK and then segmented each um, layer of the eye image and based on that on they identified like classify different image uh, different uh, disease based on the each layer, like the maybe, uh, like my background is computer science, so I know a little bit uh, this sector. So, like the thickness and the white and other things, uh, even the uh, maybe the melanoma things, they have uh, identified uh, like all the images and then uh, all the diseases, and then they put those algorithm in the Google cluster, so we can now use those class those algorithm and maybe all are not uh, freely available so we can get those uh, algorithm and recently I have invited from the Google like on ophthalmologist in from the uh, USA and they would like to extend these things so yep that's dealing with sort of OCT images what I'm trying to talk about is what's happening in terms of fundus imaging people looking you know if someone looks in and doesn't take an image that's one thing but more and more what I think that we're going to be seeing is that technology is going to stop us looking, we'll be looking at pictures. And certainly for diabetics now in Australia, or originally in New Zealand, every diabetic gets screened, I don't know, with a, a picture, you know, once a year, every two years. And the same is going to be, ha or, or, you know, they've funded it in Australia. And people are trying to put machine learning in that simply to try and weed out all the normals for a start. And I don't know within those sorts of programs because they're the, they are the biggest programs of that, that are sort of state run, but all of the um, you know, spec savers and OPSM are the two biggest companies and they're the ones who probably do more funders images than anybody else. Um, they are just doing images and, and having a look at them and I've certainly seen you know lesions uh, in photographs that have been taken whereas if they've been run through machine learning, something else would have would have shown up because the, the the optometrists are really looking at only one or two aspects which is the macula and the disc and yep. they're kind of ignoring most of the photograph and yeah. that's where machine learning um, is going to come from but I think it needs to be something that's not done in major centres we've got to actually push it back out into the community and part of that is once someone's got a lesion you've actually got to you know tell them and give them something because if they don't, then they, you know, most of us can't remember when we last went to the doctor or when we, you know, if it's been two or three years since we last uh, had an eye examination, no one remembers that. Yeah. And particularly if someone just says, oh, you've got a bit of a nevus there, everyone's just going to move on. We actually need something which is what Bertel's talking about, which is saying, this is what it is, that's how big it is, these are the risk factors, yeah. you should have it reviewed in two years' time, something like that and it needs to be reviewed just in screening or it needs to be reviewed by this level of person and that's certainly what we're trying to do at the Eye and Ear Hospital. We're trying to get patients out of our system who are there just for screening of what are probably low risk uh, uh, things but you need to empower patients to, um, to, uh, to take that information and then take it on to someone who's perhaps not as skilled, hasn't seen as many because like Ian said, you know, the average GP is going to see one. I don't know how many, I haven't done the figures on the optometrists, but, you know, they're not going to see that many either. And so we need to rely on something other than the skill based of someone who's recognising something as, so, as opposed to something that's abnormal. Yeah, so in this case, maybe it is possible to develop some apps using this machine learning model. And then, like, using your experience, we can include those things in the machine learning uh, model. So then the machine learning model, like the apps can give some uh, idea when GP will, will use these apps, then he can uh, give some indication of you should like meet with the uh, expert people or the some specialist doctor, or you should uh, visit within this month. Yeah. So apps could be useful for this case. Yeah. They've already got machine learning that can look at diabetic retinopathy yeah. and can even identify the gender of the patient from the fundus photograph and predict dementia in 10 years' time. So that already exists. Yeah. Um, 
With regards to empowering patients, we give every patient a, at Oxford, we give every patient a fundus photograph so that wherever they go, they take the picture with them. With regards to looking at pictures, um, this morning at 3 o'clock, I diagnosed a real melanoma back in England <laughs> on the basis of the color photography, OCT, and autofluorescence. And um, I advised the ophthalmologist not to send the patient to me in Oxford, but where I don't treat patients, I only diagnose at Oxford. I treat at Moorfields, so I advise them to send the patient to Moorfields instead of Oxford to expedite treatment. One of the dangers of doing ocular oncology in hospital clinics nowadays is to forget to examine the patient. Because by the time the patient walks into the room, you've already looked at all the images, you know exactly what it is. You've seen more that you're gonna, than you're gonna see with the ophthalmoscope, but the patient expects you to look at the back of the eye. And if you forget to do so, it's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> We had an a AI medical expert here about a month ago for our drug development workshop, and he showed us a very interesting example just in, the lit in the literature where they got the computer to differentiate between a wolf and a dog. And the, the difference was not to do with the animal. When they analyzed what the machine was, was looking at, it was looking at snow. So all the pictures of wolves had snow in the background, and so it had an accuracy of a rate of 95% in picking a wolf on a dog on the basis of whether there was white in the background. It had nothing to do with the dog. So sometimes you have to be a little bit careful about what you feed into a computer. Um, uh, so, I mean, I'm certainly, do you want to say something, Mark? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, so it sounds like there's already, you know, there's clearly so many questions that are relevant to that, to the sort of entry point of the disease uh, that we've just uh, discussed. Are there any funding options to kind of, I guess, bring it back to the grant, like where we'll get the money from? Um, are there any funding options linked to the sort of ophthalmology community that, you know, oncologists like me wouldn't be aware of? I mean, fundamentally, it's what, where, where do we get our money from? Basically, it's philanthropy, government linked sources, and, and, and obviously industry. So, yeah, I mean, right, right, exactly. So, are there any, are there any options uh, across those three? Well, categories linked to the IQ. Okay, well, Specsavers have put a million dollars into uh, the funding for this diabetic screening. Their return on investment is probably, uh, you know, 20% per year, so it's a great investment for them. I'm not quite so sure if they're going to be so keen about uh, uh, Nevi, unless it's going to drive up business, but certainly we live in a world which, which is... Um, uh, driven, you know, there's, there's a lot of commercial operators out there and we've, we have to recognise that that's the case. Um, many years ago we got funding as a, our ocular oncology group, where we got a public health grant and we did uh, the environment and eye health study and that was looking at trying to register all those who uh, got an ocular melanoma over a three year period and our New Zealand colleagues I think referred to that information giving us eight per million um, per year as, uh, as our incidence. Um, trying to deal in that upfront space is certainly an area where we probably, we as ophthalmologists probably need to uh, find better ways. That there is some research money in, um, uh, in uh, uh, ophthalmology. There's certainly um, uh, philanthropy. We've got to remember that there's two great fears in life. One's death and the other's blindness. And we can try and put it together. Not that we're trying to scare everybody, but uh, you know, those are the sorts of things that um, we as a group need to kind of leverage off and try and find ways of um, uh, certainly helping, I think, w at our front end ocular oncology surgical side, we have to find better ways of, of us cooperating because we, we're silos partly because uh, of uh, geographic separation, but we also very much recognise that, you know, we've only got 200 patients per year. If we're going to get new therapies, whatever they are, for either eye disease or systemically, um, we have to be looking as though we're, um, uh, we're all holding hands. John, also we need to think about engaging with optometrists. I mean, <coughs> and that opens up another whole sphere for um, possible funding. I mean, um, we just have to accept that, you know, optometrists are the primary eye health you know, providers. They're the primary screeners uh, these days for ophthalmic disease. A lot of our 
patients are coming via, um, at least with Nevi, coming via optometrists. And I think uh, if, you know, there's likely to be some funding opportunities, um, more funding opportunities for us if we engage with optometry. I mean, I know the guide dogs have a lot of money and they've dedicated all their funding and actually they run a, an institute at uh, UNSW, the, um, what's it called, Michelle? Centre for Eye Health, a very, very well equipped. Uh, yeah, uh, well, Michelle's actually an optometrist uh, in a former life, so I'll. So, sorry, I'll, I'll butt in a little bit. So, I'm, I'm a researcher who happens to be an optometrist, um, and I teach in an optometry school. Um, but the opportunity for partnership grants with Centre for Eye Health, for example, with Specsavers, um, and I don't like corporate optometry, which is why I'm not doing corporate optometry. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we as, a, as a profession in optometry, we're very keen to try and diagnose things earlier. Our teaching is based on trying to uh, train our students to identify nevi. We've got actually guidelines that we have for paths of referral for nevi. Um, it's not as bad as it seems, perhaps. And, I do think that making partnerships might be really helpful for helping the field generally. So um, I, I encourage more dialogue and um, certainly I'm wearing my optometry hat just for now, but I, I think um, you know, there's a lot of perhaps scope for engaging at the front end as Georgina suggests because that's really where a big difference can be made, perhaps. So anyway, sorry, I'm butting in. But Thanks, Michelle. Well, I, I think the fact that we've recognised that one group has optometry screening guidelines for Nevi, and I don't know about it, um, and they're probably not down in Victoria, um, uh, just tells us that we've got to communicate better. Yeah. So the first thing you could do is send, send Max and everyone a copy of those. That'd be great, um, because we're in our own development of guidelines, we need to have you know, interaction with, with, with all the other groups. We need to know what they're doing. And from, the school, from the school point of view, um, I mean, certainly teaching is where things start. So, um, you know, educating people when they're training, and, and that's what everyone here is about, is really about helping people who are training to be better clinicians, to help patients better, um, that would be a very good place to start. So the optometry schools mostly have clinics. Certainly that would be a good place to um, maybe engage at the front end as well. So uh, I'm not talking about the melanoma part so much, but really the nevus part and the clinics that the schools run see a lot of patients. The Centre for Eye Health sees probably 10,000 people referred every year, not for Nevi, but for other things, but certainly that's a, a population that could be looked at. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an area that maybe is good for grants. Um, right. Um, I, guess, uh, I guess if we sort of put this together then, we've sort of got one aspect we think we might have some traction in with engaging with the optometrists. Uh, one aspect of the other end of the disease is the sort of fancy drugs, and so Georgina and I will solve that problem eventually. Uh, that could go into yeah, that, will, that, will, that will go into the grant. Now, if we go back to the middle, n n let me be provocative, Nick. Uh, so next year you're going to have your next Nature Genetics paper. You'll, ha you'll have your 130 um, whole genome sequenced ocular melanomas. W what's next for you in the ocular melanoma sphere after that paper comes out, and you'll have a very good idea of what goes on? Uh, wh where, where are we going between in the in the pathophysiology space? It's a simple one, it's genetics. The one thing that astounds me that with all the you know, um, patients that have been seen worldwide over the last decades, how few have given a blood sample for genetic analysis. There's been one uveal melanoma GWAS for only a couple of hundred patients and we have instigated um, an international GWAS that's funded through NIH. We just need the samples. So basically, we need people to donate blood samples from any case that they've got, and we can look at the genetics. And that comes in two flavors. One is the population basis, so that's for the GWAS. But the other is, as Jane um, pointed out when she spoke about what we're doing in Queensland, we're getting family history information of all cases, because 
the patient isn't there in isolation. And as you've heard, the uveal melanoma patients that um, we've ascertained actually have a much higher cancer incidence than you would expect for the general population. Once again, pointing to some genetic predisposition. So we need a wider collection of families, and we also need you know, more um, patients. So I'd advocate that no matter what study gets funded by anyone, clinical trial or otherwise, one of the most important things to have a budget for is a blood sample for DNA. Or can we use saliva? Because or, if we're going to do it spec savers, no one's taking blood in spec um, savers, but they'll spit in a tube for you. Yeah, you, you can spit in a tube. Funnily enough, spit in a tube actually costs more than a blood tube. But Just moving on from that and looking at the second part of the, the thing without preempting you, it's about guidelines. And if there are people around who say, you know, we should... Uh, collect specimens, we should buy a bank, we should take blood, saliva, um, uh, family histories, all those come into having uh, uh, common data and that's one of the things that we st still aren't doing and to me the way of uh, trying to achieve this, uh, they've done it in the UK, they have a national guideline and um, the last national guideline for us was an NH and MRC um, group about 10 years ago that wrote up some stuff um, and I think that we're all doing our own guidelines state by state and I know that I've certainly um, in Victoria they went around all the major cancer groups and this started off national guidelines they did them in Victoria a fellow Bob Thomas was the director of cancer and he's a friend of mine he operated on my mother I was I was his resident in my first year but he always apologised because the problem with ocular melanoma was we were in the rare cancer category and that's where we remain. So unless we do these guidelines, and I think that they need to be guidelines that ophthalmic oncologists agree on, I think they need to have epidemiologists, they need to have cancer physicians, they need to have researchers all having input into this because this is the only way us at the front end are going to get some resources in order to... Um, uh, comply with guidelines and I think that getting the college to approve these is the first step because it says that if you want to be in treating in this space you need your institution to give you the imprimatur to do it and you need to have um, you know be carrying out appropriate stuff and the only way you can the only way that someone would know what I do is if they audited my data, and if I don't have good data, um, then nobody know, actually knows, and it's it's not good enough in this in this day and age. So, I have I, some slides on the guidelines uh, which we could put up just to show you that there there are some guidelines that are um, that have been done, um, which are ones you refer to, um, just to sort of start that discussion. Although we don't have that much time for it uh, anymore, but so these are some guidelines that I've collected. They're in my Dropbox. If anyone wants to me to share the link. This is the Alberta Health Services Guidelines. This is the NICE Guidelines. I don't know how active they are anymore, Bertel, but they exist. It's actually quite a nice discussion, really, where they go through some of the very pertinent issues in this guideline document. This is the new NCCN Guidelines. So there's, I printed them out if anyone wants them there on the front. Um, so they're actually also quite useful and quite recent. Um, and there's also this Australian Guideline thing, which is a supplement in something else. Uh, and, and I think, who, Max, you said you were involved in that at some point, is that right? Many, many years. Yes, so, so that kind of needs updating. Um, and then recently, John, your group, um, also this came through that Michael um, put emailed round for people's comments, uh, which also could form a nidus of a guideline document. Um, do you want to speak about that? Yeah, so the idea is it's, it's a nidus. These originally started as Victorian state guidelines, the idea was to make sure that people in the country and the city were getting appropriate and adequate care. And as I said, it, there was no ocular melanoma. And in fact, ocular melanoma, these are really dealing just with uveal melanoma to start with. But we've asked Michael to work with us at the hospital because the hospital, I go and say, oh, I need all these services, and they say, why? And I say, well, um, 
because everybody else does it this way. And as a clinician these days, they don't believe you, so you need a third party. And that third party has to have national agreed guidelines um, before they will allocate your resources. The thing about it in Victoria is once you've got a guideline, there is a whole raft of people out there who will actually help you create guidelines. You don't have to do it yourself because they've done it all before. But not only that, they'll then support you. And this is the only way that we're going to get a, a multidisciplinary meeting. We don't have them at the moment because we don't have access to the infrastructure to, um, uh, to do that as, uh, as ophthalmologists. And I think that we need to, like Max has done, invite our whole ophthalmic community to do this because it's not just UV or melanoma, but it's got to be all parts of cancer, all cancers right from good prognosis right through to bad prognosis kind of need to be dealt with um, by some method. And this is the method that I see that we will uh, entice people to um, uh, provide us with that upfront support. Because it's basically, it's not research, it's just, it's just clinical care. And clinical care, I think, is not just uh, a sample audit, but I think you've got to audit the whole of your outcome of, of these patients because it's okay to sample audit things like cataracts where things go wrong at the start, but if you sample audit uh, ocular melanoma, it's only the ones that, uh, uh, it's the good 50% that keep coming to see you and you'll get a false impression of what happens if you don't um, actually have proper uh, long-term follow-up audit. And if you work in an eye hospital, the concept that uh, anything extends beyond about a week is uh, uh, probably about the extent of corporate memory in an eye hospital. Um, fortunately, some other people work in multidisciplinary hospitals, and it really is quite a, um, uh, the, the difference between those two sorts of organisations is, is, is quite immense. If you can marry the two together, I think you're, uh, you're lucky. Unfortunately, the Iron Ear Hospital in Melbourne has, um, uh, which was been over 150 years in the central city, they decided to rebuild it on its same site um, because they thought that being independent was a great idea. At one level it is because you've got control over what you do, but you lose out on all those other uh, uh, vital uh, aspects of uh, uh, medical care these days, which is, you know, the hip bone's connected to the knee bone. Yeah, I, I think guidelines are critical standards of care that we must achieve and we need to help make sure the hospital helps us to achieve those standards of care but i think it's really really important for patients when they are first when they first come to the hospital to be given a list of standards that they should expect and the patient demand will really improve standards i think uh, when i was i don't know if you were there when i spoke about the Bill of Rights, that patients should have a Bill of Rights. They should be informed of this, they sh this should happen, they should be given this and this and that. And I almost got a standing ovation for su suggesting that patients should be informed of their rights specific to uveal melanoma care. Um, and that will, I'm sure, will really improve standards by obliging the hospitals to give us what we need to do a good job. And I think that extends right through. I think there was a, a request there to have uh, guidelines for systemic surveillance. And I think that um, the important thing to remember about guidelines is that, it's, that it's, it's a list of ingredients. It's not necessarily the recipe book. And there are going to be variations for a whole lot of reasons. Some people may choose not to have systemic surveillance. Some people might have a blood test once a year. Some, someone else might, uh, with the same disease risk might have uh, want a, a liver MRI every three months. And I think we've got to recognise that. A guideline is not to, to be definitive about exactly how it's handed out to each patient, but it is just a list of ingredients. And I think that if we get the ingredients, then each centre will still have to develop its protocols. I think that's, that's, that's the way I would see a guideline. around cutaneous melanoma and advice about, I guess, processes, who should be in the room and, and any ideas for funding, I guess, to support the... Support oh, great, the great question. So 
We've now got new <coughs> cutaneous melanoma guidelines which were launched last year in May um, and they're on a wiki platform which means we can update them pretty quickly um, as new information comes to light. And it was a very long process and it continues to be a long process um, uh, supported by the Cancer Council and supported by MIA. We fundraised to um, fund a full-time staff member and it was done very structured guidelines around questions. So it was a very long process because we first asked the questions, then we had to cull the questions. So questions like, who gets uveal melanoma? What are the risk factors for uveal melanoma? Um, how is uveal melanoma diagnosed, etc.? So a list of questions from beginning to end of the patient journey. And then there is actually a lot of guidelines on how to generate guidelines, as, as many of you would know. And so using those guidelines, we culled down to the main clinical questions and then developed working parties for each of those questions. But we paid for staff to do the literature search and then had, had um, evidence-based guidelines based on the literature search, which had another set of guidelines about what is acceptable as literature. But that process was very long. Um, it was not that expensive, really, if you can get at least a full-time um, staff member to drive it and to uh, head the data collection and the literature searches. Um, and then we had the support of the Cancer Council as well, which gives you an another a layer of infrastructure for the searches. It was a very long process. And um, uh, I chaired two of the questions. One was about systemic drug therapy in stage four and another was about brain metastases. But then we had everything from where to go, risk factors, lentigo maligna, et cetera, et cetera. So all the major questions were addressed, but it is a very long evidence-based process. But that would be something that we could um, put a grant in for to get that infrastructure so that someone can drive it to make it happen. And is that helpful? Wonderful question. So that's another element um, to it. Um, in New South Wales, for example, and Anthony's part of this group, we've put, and actually Max, you're part of the, are you part of the, mel yeah, because we're gonna move on to ocular melanoma. And it's, so are you, Svetlana, as well. Um, so it's a big group across the state. Um, just to give you an example of how we're measuring things, I mean, it's too early to measure how these guidelines improve things, but that's a whole other element of it. But what we are doing in New South Wales with the Cancer Institute, Cancer Institute is the government body that administers funds, government funds for cancer um, clinical work and research. And um, we have a committee that is looking at outcomes of patients by combining all the databases for our state for public hospitals. We're putting that data together to understand, first of all, just to look, see or how patients are managed with cutaneous melanoma and their outcomes to then go back and say, are we giving best evidence care to our patients and then come up with ways to improve that, which will include the guidelines, but of course, a lot of other things. For example, you mentioned tick boxes so that if you have a melanoma, you, um, you only go to centres that have the big melanoma tick, which the um, NHS has successfully implemented for cutaneous and obviously veal melanoma too, is that right? Yeah. yeah, so we don't have that. But we've already seen, for example, if I'm allowed to talk out of the committee, I don't think this is confidential, but 40% of patients with cutaneous melanoma um, were not managed to uh, best evidence. Now, there may be reasons for that, very good reasons, but there may not be. And so we now have to explore that, implement the clinical guidelines and measure the changes and come up with other ways of how can we best implement these best practice guidelines, for example, the NHS system. But we've got a think tank working on that part of it now. That's great. Um, could I just make one comment that one of the things that we've got to be very careful of is that we create a national guideline that we can all follow. And we've put our fellow uh, Michael in touch with the person who's doing it um, at, uh, in the New South Wales group. And I don't view, I think that 
the concept here is that we need, as a body, to say, yes, we need a set of guidelines. We all need to approve it. And it's going to have um, uh, a whole lot of components. Um, we're going to try and drive the ophthalmic side of it, but clearly we need lots of other components of it as well. But we as a, the alliance need to say, look, this is a good idea to have a national guideline and that there should be just a national guideline that we're all, we all contribute to. That's, that's what I would see that document is trying to do. So, our, our, the, first of all, the melanoma cutaneous are national guidelines, and um, there's a single committee of about 20 people, which included GPs, community representation, and then all the specialties, often two or three representat representatives of dermatology, surgical oncology, neurosurgery, radiotherapy, medical oncology. You could set up exactly the same infrastructure for this, a national group representing optometrists community members, ophthalmologists, medical oncologists, pathologists, etc., and do exactly the same thing. That, that's what I'm suggesting this document is, Should be. is, is, Great. is, is the tip of the arrow. This is not the final document, but one thing we've also got to be wary of, of is overreach. Having a document of any sort would be a start for us, um, and I think the NH and MRC ones done 10 years ago were, were not a bad attempt, but they weren't done in the right sector, which was, you know, all the, all the people um, being involved with it. Um, just as if, uh, you know, the optometrists have got guidelines for Nevi, um, everyone else needs to know about it as well. And I'm trying to circulate these so that if people want to have an input, and we've got funding at the moment for a guy in Melbourne to do it part time, but this is also, um, you know, a much uh, rarer disease where. It w the optometrists and ophthalmologists can sing from the same song sheet in terms of nevi, yeah? Because the GPs and the surgical oncologists and dermatologists all sing from the same songbook in that cutaneous melanoma is managed the same way by all of those groups. Is, is that the case? Sorry for my ignorance, but I, I well, just don't know be. that end. It should be, but historically because of... Um, all, all, all those people train through the same sort of medical system. And if you go back to see how optometrists train, optometrists have, have, have always trained um, alongside. They haven't been trained through the same stream. So that there has been a lack of uh, interaction, I suppose. Um, but more and more, the, you know, there needs to be sort of collaborative care. And there are collaborative care guidelines that have been drawn up for things such as glaucoma in particular, and that's one that um, uh, would be the biggest example, but that's a big disease. Um, I think that we as a group should provide the leadership to say these are the, you know, find out what, what the optometrists do, comment on them, let them have guidelines, but the guidelines that everybody's agreed upon, that's, that's you know, th there should be an optometrist on this, on this uh, group as part of it. Mm. Okay, I'm just mindful of the time. So um, the it's five past five, and the program only went till five. So um, we do have to sort of wrap up. But I think it's been a very productive discussion, and certainly a lot of food for thought. Uh, the last item on the agenda was where where to next year. So at the moment, Bill Glaston's put his hand up to host the meeting next year. But I'm certainly happy to let the Victorians and the Queenslanders fight that out. Uh, as to if John wants to take on Bill, uh, you're welcome. Uh, so if you guys want to discuss it, I think I think the sort of the enthusiasm here certainly from, I think that I'm feeling from everyone around here is we should have a meeting next year, um, and that would be great to get everyone together again to see how we can progress. And maybe I'll follow up with some emails with regards to what we can do in terms of guidelines and uh, and looking at opportunities to help Michael Barton um, finish that to see if we can help in any way. Um, um, and uh, then tomorrow, obviously, is the patient focus day. So everyone is welcome. Every doctor is welcome to attend the, the patient day, and the patients were welcome to attend the doctor day. So if anyone wants to come tomorrow, uh, please do so. Um, are there any burning questions, uh, comments? Please, if you have any comments, um, uh, advice, or abuse, uh, email me directly, uh, and um, or you can. Hashtag Twitter it, saying this was a crap meeting order. Um, and, um, but thank you all very much for your attendance and enthusiasm, very much appreciated. Thank you all the speakers and um, uh, 
and uh, we'll all see each other soon, I hope.